And so I started with the story, and I want to continue with that verse, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 to 11, on the story of the Shunammite woman. So I, we, I want to read it to you. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunam, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food, and she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall, and let us put a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. So it will be, whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. So it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to her, Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. And when he called her, the Bible says in verse 13, what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I don't need anything. I dwell among my own people. But he said, what then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered in verse 14, actually she has no son and her husband is already old. So he said, call her, and when he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he began to prophesy to her and said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And church, we have been talking about this, about this time next year, that if you spend time with God, God has a purpose for you. God will speak His rhema word for you. And if you hear His voice, about the same time this year, about the same time next year, you will be a different person. You will be blessed beyond measure. Who can say amen? amen? So just to refresh your memory from the very first two sermon series, from this passage, we learned that he, she put in four furnitures, four items inside that room. The first one was the bed. And we said that the bed speaks of our faith to rest in God. And it's important for us to learn to rest in God, to spend time and to sell out before the Lord. Why? Because our faith to rest in God will ensure that our faith at work works. And we ended by saying that to rest in God, the bed, is essential so that our hearts at the beginning of the year are calibrated and are aligned with God's heart and with God's worship. So that we are still worshipping God genuinely and not worshipping God simply to make us successful. You see, church is important. Because both sounds the same. But if you are not careful, the little difference, the little variant in your heart will lead you to a very far and wrong destination that God has reserved for you and I at the end of 2019. So it's vital for you and I to begin the year with a right heart, with an aligned spirit. Who can say amen? Then we talk about the table and the chair. And we know that the table and the chair are a reminder to us that in the midst of our busyness and in our relentless pursuit of success, sometimes it's vital for us to learn to stop in the midst of our success so that we can sit down and to have fellowship with God so that we won't get ahead of God, so that your plan will not interfere with His plan for you and I. And we ended by saying that sitting down to have fellowship with God is neither sloth nor stoicism. But it is a strategy. It is a strategy for longevity. Because at the end of the day, God wants you to complete and finish His assignment for you this year in 2019. You see, what's the point? And He used this analogy in Luke chapter 14, verse 28. Salt is good, but if salt loses its saltiness, what then that salt is used for? It's no more of use. And it's very hard for the salt to regain back its saltiness. In a way, he's trying to tell you, guys, at the beginning of the year, it's good that you guys are fired up, passionate, but what good if your passion doesn't last? You see, for many of us at the beginning of the year, we always are passionate about what? Losing weight. The number one, you know, a resolution that every one of us always make at the beginning of the year is that we are passionate about losing weight, right? So we say, 2019, I'm going to lose 50 kg. But here we are in February, after Chinese New Year, we have just gained 10 kg. Hallelujah. <laughs> what happened? Right, the beginning of the year, we are passionate, we are on fire. But what good if your passion doesn't last? 
What good if your enthusiasm and excitement don't last? That's why it's important for you to learn to sit down, fellowship with God and count the cost so that this journey with Jesus is a marathon journey and you are able to complete and you are able to finish the assignment that He has given for you this year in 2019. Come on, give God a big hand. The table and the chair is a strategy for longevity. So this week, I want to conclude this series. Finally, hallelujah. I don't want to be stuck in the book of Numbers as well. Amen, right? <laughs> I don't want to be stuck in, the, in a small room for the longest time. Amen, right? Finally, amen, right? We want to talk about the last piece of furniture the woman put inside that room and that is the candlestick. Somebody say with me, the candlestick. Now, the Hebrew word candlestick in 2 Kings chapter 4 is the word menorah. Now, the candlestick or the menorah is used to hold the candles up so that the candles can light up the entire room. So if you can see the picture over here, notice it is not the one who provides the light, but it is the item that holds the candles up to provide the light. So basically, the candlestick is the source of illumination. So it speaks of our communion with the Holy Spirit. The candlestick represents our communion with the Holy Spirit. Now church, why is it important that this last piece of furniture speaks to us of the communion of the Holy Spirit? Because after you and I set your heart right before the Lord, and after you guys have sat down and count the cost and planned for this year for 2019, God will give you a promise, just like how He has promised our church. Psalm 65 verse 11, that this year, our year will be crowned with goodness, and that our path will be dripping with abundance. How many of you can say amen? amen? And you know what? In our pursuit of this promise, in our pursuit of the blessing that God has in store for you and I, this year in 2019, yes, we have set our hearts right. Yes, we have made plans before the Lord, counting on Him to direct our path. But at the end of the day, the actual going through it, the actual overcoming obstacles, that is right in front of us for this year in 2019. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, He says what? The word of the Lord to Zerubbabel say, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. At the end of the day, you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to go through this year in 2019. You know what, church? Why is it that the candlestick represents the communion of the Holy Spirit? Because in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it's a famous verse that we always use in prayer. It begins in verse 1. And in verse 1, the Lord instructed Zechariah the prophet to prophesy to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah then, to build the second temple after they were allowed to return from exile from Babylon. And interestingly, the Lord showed Zechariah the prophet a vision, a vision to kickstart this project of rebuilding the second temple. And the vision that God gave to Zechariah for Zerubbabel was a menorah, a candlestick. Now look at Zechariah 4 verse 1 to 3. The angel who talked with me returned, woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. And he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it. Seven channels to the lamp. And also there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other one on its left. So this golden lampstand that Zechariah saw in the vision looked like this. Now it symbolized the task of rebuilding the second temple. It was a mission and it was a project that God gave to Zerubbabel to lead and to take charge. But friends, God knows that this mission ahead for Zerubbabel is not going to be an easy mission. <laughs> it is going to be very difficult. Faced with very limited resources, faced with limited manpower, fierce external opposition, and also internal discouragement. God knows that it is going to take its toll on Zerubbabel and his team. 
And let me tell you, church, to give you an idea of how difficult this mission is going to take, for the very first temple, the temple that Solomon built, Solomon had 300,000 manpower to build them. Solomon also had unlimited fund to complete the project. He didn't need to raise any building fund because he had funds from his dad, David, who had already prepared for him the treasury sum of today's equivalent $300 billion. In short, Solomon, to build the first temple, he faced no problem, no limited resources, and no limited manpower. But for this second temple that God tasked Zerubbabel, do you know Zerubbabel had only 50,000 Israelites who were willing to go back with him to build the temple. They had no money and they had limited resources. In fact, the Bible says, just to build the foundation alone, it took him 16 long years. And even at the 16th year, they met with a problem as there was a change of leadership in Babylon and the project stopped. And only during the time of King Darius, then they managed to restart the building project all over again. That's why the Lord say, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. That's why he says, I'm going to prophesy to you Zechariah 4 verse 6. It is not going to be by your mic, nor by your power, but it's going to be by the power of my spirit. Come on, give God a big hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> Similarly, for us this year and for you and I this year in 2019, the promise for you is that you will be crowned with goodness and that your power will be dripping with abundance. But friends, how many of you know the promise is good, but the actualization of that promise is not so easy? You're going to face with many tasks and many problems. Now church, now today is only February. I already faced a lot of problems already. Hallelujah, right? Many of us don't need to wait until December. <laughs> you know, right? Some of you are already facing problems at the beginning of the year. You know what, just last week in cell group meeting, I heard of my member just got retrenched. Some faced with financial crisis. Some faced with health crisis. You see, church, the road ahead is not going to be easy. But yet, the Bible says, even though it's not going to be easy, that's why you need to know it's not going to be by your mic, nor by your power, but it's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, give God a big hand. Hallelujah. You see, church, only when the Holy Spirit come upon you, only when you are divinely empowered from on high, only when you are anointed by the Holy Spirit, the moment you are anointed by the Holy Spirit, verse 7 and 8, Zechariah 4, will happen to you. It says here, when Zechariah anoints Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel will say, what are you mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. And then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. And the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple and his hand will also complete it. And you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. You see church, when the Spirit of God come upon you, when the anointing of God come upon you, every mountain will be brought into level ground. That means every obstacles cannot stop you. Every opposition you shall overcome. Every discouragement to stop you, you will prevail. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why after you have set your heart right, after you have made plans before the Lord, but unless the Lord builds His house, he who labor will labor in vain. If you are not empowered from on high, then everything is going to be difficult. If you are not empowered or anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will be faced easily with discouragement. That's why with the anointing, it's not that you will escape struggles or difficulties, but it's just that you'll be able to go through struggle with greater ease. Who can say amen? With the anointing upon you, you will not see troubles and trials as obstruction to your purpose or goals. But with the anointing, 
you will see trials and troubles as dumbbells and treadmills for your soul. Why dumbbells and treadmills? Because with the anointing, God will change your troubles and trials into drum, dumbbells and treadmills to build what? Strength and stamina for your spirit to last through the journey and complete the race in Jesus' name. That is why it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why City Harvest Church, if there is one thing that is needed that you and I must do, is that you need to be empowered from on high. You need to spend time and dig deeper in the presence of God. That's why this candlestick is a reminder to you. Before we embark this journey in 2019, please spend some time to rebuild your altar and your communion with the Holy Spirit so that you can be empowered from on high, so that you can have the anointing coming upon you. And last week, what a great conference we had and what a fitting one to begin this year in 2019. Who can say amen? Because Pastor Bill Johnson said and reminded us, the Holy Spirit is in everyone, but not upon everyone. The Holy Spirit is inside us, but not everyone has the Holy Spirit resting upon them. And that's why the secret of the power is the ability to have the Holy Spirit coming upon you and rest upon you to host the presence of God and to be more aware of the anointing that is upon your life. And that's why you and I need to spend time and commune with the Holy Spirit because He is already inside you. But now He wants to have the power and the anointing coming upon you and resting upon you for this year in 2019 so that every mountain will be brought into level ground and you are able to complete 2019 in Jesus' name. How many of you can say amen? So how to do it? You know what, pastor, you talk so much, how to do it? Hallelujah, right? I mean, you talk so much about the introduction. Tell me how to have the Holy Spirit coming upon me to rest upon me. I'm glad you asked. Because if you today look at the life of David, we can understand and study how did the Holy Spirit come upon David and rested upon him and make him the greatest king of Israel. How did he do it? How many of you are ready to hear the word of God? Amen? This morning, don't worry. I only have two points. Hallelujah, right? Two points. Amen, right? Number one, right? He says here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 5 to 13. Samuel replied, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now he says this, Consecrate yourself and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. You know, when I saw this verse, I'm so encouraged. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> because the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. People judge me by my accent, but the Lord looks at my heart. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord had not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Jesse said, they're still the youngest. But he's behind tending sheep. Samuel said, send for him because we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. And he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. The Spirit had been in David. But that day when he was anointed, the Holy Spirit came powerfully upon him and rested on him. What can we learn from here? When Samuel was tasked to anoint a king to replace Saul, you notice that it is important for him to first and foremost consecrate the candidates first. You see church, before our year this year, crowned with goodness and your path dripping in abundance, 
there must be a consecration. So point number one, before every crowning, there must be a consecrating. Before every crowning, there must be a consecrating. How to have the Holy Spirit coming upon you? Consecrate your life. Consecrate your life. Now church, the word consecration means set apart. Somebody say with me, set apart. So my question to you is this year, how are you setting apart your life to be ready for the anointing to come upon you? Now, in the case of David, unlike the rest of his brothers who were consecrated openly, David was consecrated by God very differently. Right? Why? Because when Samuel, after looking at all the seven candidates in front of him, said, the Lord hath not chosen these. And he asked Jesse, is that all you got? Is that all the sons you got? Jesse, the father said, well, I have one more. He is the youngest. Now, the Hebrew word for the word youngest implies the most insignificant, the most unimportant one in the family, doing the most unimportant work. What is that? Tending sheep behind. Now, church, if you are David, imagine if you are David, how would you feel and how David must have felt all this while living in the house of Jesse? David, all this while felt left out, not popular, not accepted, not well liked in school, not hype beast. Hallelujah. And the thing is this he felt he was left out. He felt that he is being treated unfairly. Now, church, this morning, some of you need to hear this. Just because you feel left out does not mean God has forgotten all about you. Sometimes, even when you feel left out, sometimes God purposely or allow you to be hidden behind, doing the most unimportant work, feeling insignificant. To you, you feel that you are being left out. But do you know, that in God's eyes, you are being consecrated for a season of crowning that is ahead of you. Come on, give God a big hand. That's why don't go around complaining when your boss gives you the most unimportant job. Because sometimes by you doing the most unimportant job, not knowing, you feel left out. But God is actually consecrating you. And that's the thing about David. David was being consecrated differently from the brothers. You see, while he feels that he's being hidden, while he feels that he's being left out, while he feels that he's being not popular, disrespected, actually God was consecrating him. God was setting him apart for such a time as this. Listen, young people emerge. Sometimes the quietest student in your class is often mistaken as being unpopular. And you look down upon them. You make fun of them. You mock them. But not knowing, these people are actually could be actually quietly living out their purpose rather than joining aimless popularity contests in school. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs, in our time, are not popular in school. They are nerdy. They are not popular at all. But they are living out quietly their purpose rather than aimlessly joining popularity contests in school. That's why young people don't chase after popularity, chase after purpose. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And the things, sometimes when you go through seasons of your life, when you feel like missing out in life, when others seem to get ahead of you, and when others seem to be more successful than you, don't feel bad. Don't feel that you are being left out. Don't feel that God has forgotten you. Listen, church, the same with an individual, the same with the church. You know what? We may think that God has forgotten City Harvest Church. You may think that other churches right now are way ahead of us. You may think that we are missing out. No, 
We are not missing out. We are at the right place where God wants us to be because He is consecrating us, preparing us for the next season of crowning all over again. Hallelujah. And that's the thing. When you go through seasons of life feeling that you are missing out, feeling that others are getting ahead of you, you must know that sometimes God allows you to go through that season because He is consecrating you. He is preparing you for your season of crowning. And David was consecrated by God in hiding, unlike the brothers consecrated in the open. And church, that's what it means. When you are being set apart, when you are being consecrated, God is doing something in your life. And the thing is this, why is it that consecration was important for David to experience? Why is it that he needs to be set apart, hidden behind, feeling a bit left out? Why is it that God allowed these things to happen in the lives of David? Because it's important. Because sometimes setting apart does not just mean doing some holy spiritual things that no one else is doing. Like, you know, fast for 40 days. You know, go to the wilderness for 40 days. No. But being set apart is also like what Bill Johnson said last week. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because God wants David to have a different mindset than the people of the world. And that's why probably David was being hidden because God does not want David to depend more like his brothers, depending on the outward appearance, depending on their handsomeness, but that God wants David to fully depend on God and in his inner qualities. How many of you can say amen? And that's the thing, being set apart, being consecrated, when you feel left alone with God, it's not that God is has forgotten about you. But sometimes God is training you, consecrating you, so that your mindset will be renewed and transformed. So that you will not be conforming to the pattern of this world. So that you will not think like how this world thinks. So that you will chase after God rather than chase after popularity contests. And when you are renewed, when your mind is renewed, when your life is transformed, the Bible says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, His pleasing, and His perfect will for you and I. Hallelujah. You see, that's why David was allowed to be consecrated, to be separated, to be hidden behind with God alone so that he can make a conscious effort to stop living your life or his life going after what is popular in this world and decide to start living your life according to the standard of God's word. How many of you can say amen to that? That's why maybe the reason that God allowed him to be hidden is so that he will not be like his brothers, conforming to this world. Church, young people, emerge. City Harvest, consecrate yourself from this world and go into hiding with God. Be willing to be set apart. Don't Think like how the world thinks. Don't conform to, the, to this world's behavior. Because in today's world, it's getting harder right now to make you spiritual. You know, it is getting harder right now for you to be set apart. It is harder for you and I right now to be able to think like how the Bible wants you to think. Especially the young people. You know, because of what? Because of this latest trend. Latest trend called FOMO. Somebody say with me, FOMO. You know what is FOMO? FOMO is the fear of missing out. You know, in today's world, young people have this thing called syndrome, called FOMO. It is the fear of missing out. And you know what? FOMO, the fear of missing out, is a psychological term today. And it means it relates to a feeling that friends and connections are leading more interesting and rewarding life. Therefore, creating a desire inside you to stay continually connected with what others are doing online. That's why you rather, right, look at your Instagram every two, three seconds rather than stay connected to the Spirit of God during sermon. 
You see, that's why FOMO caused you to feel that what you're doing right now has no meaning and value and others outside are doing more valuable things than you. And that's why you're constantly scared to miss out. That's why you're always going back to your Facebook. <gasps> oh man, did you see that? Did you see all our friends are in National Stadium watching BTS? Look at us here. We are here. We are stuck here. And this preacher is preaching so long. <laughs> and then you are always comparing yourself. Oh man, do you see this? Have you seen this? You got to do this. Come on, man. You got to dress up like this guy over here. Come on, man. You are no longer cool. It is the fear of missing out. And you're always wanting to stay connected online. And do you know, it's a, it's, it's a terrible thing. Because psychologists at Nottingham Trent University recently investigated the factors driving addiction to social networking sites among people in the UK. The study investigated a range of factors relating to participants' personalities and their social media use. And writing in the International Journal of Cyber Psychology, Behavior and Social Networking, when looking at all the collective factors driving their addictive behavior, they said this, for more, Irrational beliefs and poor mental health explain participants' social media addiction almost entirely. And when they look at each of the factors individually, the researchers found that FOMO was the most significant contributing factor to explain the emergence of social media addiction. Today, people are addicted to social media rather than God. Even when they come to church, you know what? If they don't have the Wi-Fi, they break into cold sweat. <laughs> if they cannot connect to their Instagram, they get agitated. And they get angry. Do you see some young people? They get angry when they are not connected to their Instagram. I wonder why. Four more. And today's young people, it's getting difficult for them to be addicted to God because they are always fearful of missing out what is going on outside. And church, the fear of missing out or FOMO leads people into conforming to this world than to conforming themselves to the Word of God. And it causes you to compromise your values at the expense of your calling and purpose. City Harvest Church, you must not have FOMO, the fear of missing out. You need to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Peer pressure and FOMO will cause you to sacrifice what is precious for something that is only temporary. And that's why God purposely hide David away from the world. So that during those times when he was being consecrated, his mindset is renewed. So that he thinks like how God thinks so that his value system is the same as God's value system. Not as the world's value system. Not like what social media tells you, what is good or what is bad. You cannot trust social media to tell you what is good and what is bad. Because those are not the word of God. How many of you can say amen? Those are not truth. Those are fabricated truth. Amen. And that's why, in short, when David was being consecrated or being hidden by God, it helps him calibrate his mind so that he is prepared to become the next king of Israel. And the thing is this, when you are consecrated, when you are able to be set apart, when you are able to be, when you have your mind renewed by God, let me tell you, consecration, being set apart by God, help you realize what is valuable and what is disposable. What is eternal in effect and what is merely temporary in nature? And young people in life, you will recognize character over talent. And in choosing your life partner, you will choose godly over handsome. How many of you can say amen? Young people emerge, you must learn from this meme from Drake. Look at this, hallelujah. I wanted to put Pastor Chuang's picture by you. 
if after that, I think we'll get into another fight again. Hallelujah, right? So I decided to choose another handsome man. Pastor Jeremy Choi here. Hallelujah, right? Learn from Drake. Choose godly over handsome. Choose godly over good looks. And young people, if you are FOMO, if you have FOMO, then you are always succumbing to peer pressure. You are always succumbing to the pressure of this world. And that they tell you, for you to have a good life partner, you must choose one that is good looking, like this guy over here, I don't even know who. But when another guy appears before you, they look like downstairs, the one below. Pastor, he is not that good looking. I want one that looks the one that I saw in the social media. That's the one that I want. Friends, if you have the fear of the Lord, you will choose godly over handsome. Because people who have the face may not have the glory of God in their face. That's why you got to choose the glory before the face. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's the thing about David. Do you notice that when David finally appeared before Samuel, it's not that the Bible forgot to mention about his features and about his looks. The Bible said that he was healthy and he was handsome. But it's just that in the eyes of God, handsome, good-looking are only secondary factors. They don't determine destiny. And young people, if you choose handsome over godly, handsome does not bring you to your destiny in God. Good looks don't bring you to where God wants you to be. It is the godliness. It is the consecration. It is the Spirit of God that will bring you to where God wants you to be. But if you have fear of missing out, you always be comparing boyfriend or girlfriend. And you're not even comparing it to another person. You're comparing it to social media standards. And you always compare, oh, where? look at my boyfriend, my boyfriend look like this. Let me tell you young people, let me tell you girls, let me tell you boys, no amount of girls or boys who ditch you is worth enough for you to commit suicide for them. Yeah. Hallelujah. I used to be young, I used to be like you, came to City Harvest Church at 14, 15 years old. I have four more. But now I am pretty young. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> Yesterday I said I'm 45 years old. Then my colleague told me, bro, you're already 46 this year, bro. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yes. <laughs> this year I'm 46. And when I look back, right? And when I look back, those times when I wanted to die, when the girl that I liked in school didn't like me, when I'm about to kill myself, when I look, they prefer Pastor Chuang than me. Hallelujah, right? Because we're in the same school. I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to change church. I say to myself, you know what? God is not fair. God is not good. But now when I look back, I, I, I look at all my behaviors. Stupid behaviors. How many of you can say Amen. Let me tell you, if someone ditch you, I tell you, God has great things in store for you. God has someone greater and better for you in Jesus' name. You got to trust God. And that's the thing. When you have the fear of the Lord, when you are consecrated, your value system will be the same as God's value system. And the thing is this, when you are free, Right? When you are free from the, you know, from, from, the, from the desires of this world, at the end of the day, you will be able to live your life set apart and live in total freedom in God. And what do you mean by total freedom in God? It means you are free from pleasing everyone instead to please only the one, our Abba Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And church, when you live your life set apart, free from FOMO, it may seem that you are indeed missing out from the fun and action on what is popular outside. Yes, it may seem that you are the tutut -tut one. Amen, right? It may seem you are, you are the nerdy one. Yeah. It may seem that you are praying and you are fasting. It may seem that you are the nerdy one. It may seem that you are missing out from what is popular outside, from what is cool outside, from what your friends are doing outside. 
It may seem so. But friends, you must understand this. Seasons of fun may not be the most fruitful time. How many of you can say amen? People are having fun outside, but they are wasting your life away. I'd rather you stuck hidden behind by God, and yet you are building up your purpose, you are building up your destiny, and one day God will say it's the right time, you'll be plucked out of obscurity, you'll be anointed, and you become the next king of Israel. Come on, give God a big hand. And you may think that you are wasting your time in God. You may think that coming to church is wasting time. And when you look every one, two seconds in your social media, oh man, look at this, my friend. Oh man, look at this. They are taking a picture of coffee in Wheeler's Yard somewhere. Hallelujah, right? Oh, I hope I'm there. I thought, I wish I could be there. Oh, look at my friend here at Santorini. Amen, hallelujah. No, 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 not that friend. Hallelujah, hallelujah, right? Not that friend. Hallelujah, right? Oh, look at my friend here. And you may think that you're missing out. You may think that God is unfair. No, church, no. God is not wasting your time. God is actually waiting for the right time for you. Like David, he was waiting. He was in obscurity. He was hidden. But one day, when the right time came, he was plucked out of obscurity. And right in front of the brothers, he was anointed and declared the king of Israel. And the Holy Spirit came upon him because he was already consecrated. Listen, church, don't be afraid being hidden because Craig Groeschel said this, if you are willing to do what no one sees you do, you will produce the results in front of everyone to see. You will produce the result that everyone to see and everyone wants to see. That's how it is. When you are willing to be consecrated, set apart by God. Point number two, hallelujah. Before every crowning, there must be training. And there must be training in God's secret place. You know what, church? It took Samuel a while to search out who is the most suitable candidate to become king. Why? Because the crown and the anointing will not come appear before you at your doorstep. How many of you can say amen? You need to be able to search it out. You need to search out the anointing. How do I know? Proverbs 25 verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but to search out a matter is the glory of a king. You see, church, if you want to be a king, then you must be willing to search out the hidden secrets and power of God. The crown is reserved for those who are willing to search the power of God. And the Bible says this, where is the, and, 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 and it's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, the Bible says this, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, church, do you notice that the Bible didn't say pray to God secretly? No. But he says what? Go to your room and pray to God who is in the secret place. That means when, that means there is a place that God purposely hides from you. There is a place where God purposely is not easily seen and is not easily found and it requires you to go to search it out. It requires you to go spend time, dig deeper until you find him. Why? Why is he that? Why is he playing so hard to get? Because the Bible says in Isaiah 45, verse 3, because I want to give you the treasures of darkness, the treasures of secrets, and hidden riches of secret places, uh, places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by name, am the God of Israel. Church, there is a blessing, there is a revelation, there is a treasure, there is a secret riches only reserved for the intimate. Not easily accessed to the public, but only reserved to the intimate. Only reserved to those who are willing to search him out. Only to those who are willing to dig deeper. Spend time longer in the presence of God until you find Him, until you experience Him. There is a place. 
there is a place, a secret place that God is hiding, waiting to give you His secrets, His treasures, His power, and His presence. And that's why I like this. Oswald Chambers said this so beautifully. He said, when you pray to your Father who is in the secret place, every public thing in your life will be marked with the lasting imprint of the presence of God. Wow. When you have gone to the secret place, everything that you do in the public have a lasting imprint of the anointing and of the presence of God. I want that. How many of you want that in your life? Who can say amen? And that's why in the case of David, in the case of David, way before he was anointed, he has been worshipping God in the secret place. While he was being hidden away from the public, what was he doing? He was worshipping. He was searching God out. He was getting to know God deeper and more intimately. And that's what David did. You know what, church? He was a shepherd boy out in the field with the sheep. It's a lowly job that meant many lonely hours. But that lonely hours, he was never alone because he was spending time with God. He would pray. He would praise Him. He would take out his lie and worship him. And he would spend hours searching and conversing with his heavenly father to know him, to understand him, to get his precious wisdom and to recognize his voice. And all these things he was doing, he was searching, he was digging deeper in the secret place of God while being hidden away from the public. But little did he know that while he is being hidden, God is actually secretly preparing him for his destiny. If you are willing to search God out in the secret place, then he will reveal to you his secret plan for you. And that is to crown you with goodness and that your path will be dripping in abundance. You know what, church? In that time of worshipping in the secret place, God was secretly training David to be king. He was secretly training David to be king. How do I know? Because right after he was anointed, the next chapter in 1 Samuel 17, the Bible says that Israel was faced with a crisis. Saul, the current king, was facing fear and defeat in front of the Philistines' army and Goliath. Now church, it's very funny because when I read this, I want to ask you a question. And that is this. This is King Saul that we are talking about. This is a very experienced king who had been to many battles before. How many of you agree together with me? This is not Tom, Dick, and Toothless Harry King. This is King Saul. And the thing is this, King Saul had defeated many enemies, and guess what? This current enemy that he's facing, Goliath and the Philistines, are not old enemies, are not new. They are old ones. In fact, the Bible says, Saul had defeated the Philistines before in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And my question to you today is this. Why is it that this time in 1 Samuel 17, when he faced the Philistines again, he was afraid and he was facing defeat? Same king, same army, same enemy. What is the difference? 1 Samuel 13 and 1 Samuel 17. The answer is found in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. What is that? In 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. Now, the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And that's the principle that we need to learn today, today this morning. The difference between victory and defeat is not how much resource you have in your hand, but how much the anointing is upon you. Come on, give God another big hand. Hallelujah, right? How much the anointing is upon you. But the boy David was different. David was inexperienced. He was disrespected. And he was forgotten. Yet, when the nation was faced with the greatest crisis of time, David was God's secret weapon, prepared and anointed for such a time as this. And the thing is this. When you look at 1 Samuel 17 in the message version, you can see why. Look at what he said to Saul in verse 32. Master, said David, 
Don't give up hope. Can you imagine? This is a guy who has never been to army telling the general, don't give up hope. And he said this, don't give up hope. He said what? I'm ready. I'm ready to go and fight the Philistines. Saul answered David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young, inexperienced. He has been in this fighting business since before you were born. But David said, no, I don't care how experienced he was. I am already ready. Now, my question to you is this. In what way David was ready? How was he ready? Since when David was ready? He was never listed before in the army. He was never trained for war. He has never been involved in any battle or any operation. Since when David was ready? But yet he said that he was ready. Why? Because in verse 34, he gave the answer. I was ready. I am ready. Because David said, because I have been a shepherd. Tending sheep for my father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I go after it. I knock it down and I rescue the lamb. And if it turn on me, I'll grab it by the throat. I'll wring its neck and I will kill it. A lion or bear, it makes no difference. And so is this Philistine giant. It makes no difference to me because I've already killed it in the spirit and now I'm going to kill it in the natural. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig. This year is the year of the pig, hallelujah, right? Every giant in your, this year will be cut down if you are anointed by the power and trained by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> hallelujah! God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will also deliver me from this Philistine. And that's a principle. What you overcome in the spirit, you will overcome in the natural. If you overcome discouragement in the spirit, you will overcome discouragement in the natural world. And that's the thing. Where was David trained? He was not trained in the battlefield. He was trained in God's secret place. Where was he trained? He was trained digging deeper, spending time longer, praying longer in the spirit until he experienced the anointing and the power of God coming upon him. In essence, he was saying, King Saul, I may not match him with experience and size, but I want you to know that I'm ready because I've been training in secret, defeating the lion and the bear. I've been spending time in God's secret place, being trained by him to face my giant for such a time as this. Because training in silence will ensure your success is loud enough for everyone to hear. And you know the end of the story. David defeated Goliath, not by the sword, nor by his bare hands, but by the spirit-propelled stone shot accurately from his slingshot of prayer. That's why it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by the Holy Spirit. That's why today you need to commune with the Holy Spirit because if the Holy Spirit come upon you, this year, it's not going to be by your mic. It is not going to be by your power. It's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit for you to achieve your goals and dreams. Give God a big hand. Hallelujah. In closing, see, you guys are happy because it's only 11.43 and I'm already closing. You know what? The, the mark of a champion is always 12 p.m. Saturday is 7 p.m. He who, went, he who goes beyond 12 p.m. is set for a destiny in God. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> the candlestick is a reminder that you need to depend on the Holy Spirit for this year to be crowned with goodness and that your power will be dripping in abundance. You need to be empowered from on high. And how to be empowered from on high? Number one, you need to consecrate yourself. And like what Joshua said, consecrate yourself because tomorrow God will do wonders among you. Number two, you need to be trained in God's secret place. You need to dig deeper. You need to go and find Him and search Him out. Because the Bible says, He who search Him will find Him. You know what, church? I want to encourage you. Don't go another year 
living a powerless Christian life. How many of you are sick and tired of living a powerless Christian life? And when, and but church, the Holy Spirit wants to give you the anointing and the power. I want to encourage you as we end this series, we have aligned our heart before the Lord. We have sat down and we have prepared ourselves for this year. But friends, there is one more ingredient that you need to have. You need to be empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God wants to give His Spirit on you without measure. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit shall rest upon you, not inside you. How many of you have been blessed today by the Word of God? Let's give Jesus one more big round of applause, shall we? Hallelujah. I want you to stand up on your feet. Church, when the Holy Spirit come upon you, just like what Isaiah 11, 1, 2 says, the Spirit of the Lord that rest, that come upon Jesus shall also rest upon you. And in that Spirit, God will give you wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, so that your year will be crowned with goodness and that your power will be dripping in abundance. Church, I want to encourage you to desire for more of God in your life, to desire for more of the Holy Spirit in your life. This week in our cell group meeting, our cell group sermon, I was very blessed by the cell group sermon. You know, the cell group sermon said this, Jesus went up to heaven 40 days after he was resurrected. And when he went up to heaven, he said, wait here and tarry in Jerusalem until power come from on high. The Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, Pentecost means 50, on the 50th day, then the Holy Spirit came. So between the 50th day and the 40th day when he went up to heaven, 50 minus 40, all you smart people say, how many? 10. That means the disciples spent 10 days in the upper room praying. But the amazing thing was this. When the offers came in the upper room, at the beginning of the 10th day, 500 of them were there. But at the end of the 10th day, only 120 were left. That means in the course of 10 days, 380 people left the community. Can you imagine? You know what? If I'm the zone supervisor, I will be sacked, you know? 10 days, you lose 380 people every day. 38 people left your community, left your church, left your cell group. If I'm the zone supervisor, I'll be discouraged. I will tender my resignation. But thank God they didn't. They kept on praying. They kept on searching. And the Bible says, suddenly, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And from one day, losing 38 people, God, in one day, Give them back 3,000 people. 3,000 people. From 10 days, they lost 380 people. In one day, that day, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, Peter went up to preach, and 3,000 people were added to the church. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. But it requires you 10 days to seek after God. To search after God. I told, my cell group, I told my cell group members, and I told this yesterday in the Saturday service, every one of us last year, at the, big, at the end of last year, had this thing called the 10-year challenge. You know the 10-year challenge, right? Putting your 10-year picture a long time ago, and putting your picture now, and supposed to tell everybody, look how young I am right now. <laughs> There's a 10-year challenge, right? Look how young I am, look how more beautiful I am, right? But friends, let's not have a 10-year challenge. Why not have a 10-day challenge? A 10-day challenge of searching after God, of focusing on the promises of God for your life and to search Him until you find Him. A 10-day challenge of consecration. A 10-day challenge of consecration. Of getting rid of FOMO. Of stopping using profane words. And start using holy words. Not that after 10 days you can continue doing so, no. <laughs> but maybe 10 days challenge is a day of consecration. That you are waiting for the power of God to come upon you. 
I really believe City Harvest Church, 10 a.m. service, we need to contend for more of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because when the Holy Spirit come upon us, let me tell you, God has a season of crowning in store for you this year. But it requires you to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Amen? How many of you want to have the Holy Spirit? Give God a big hand. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want you to lift up your hands to heaven. I want you to pray in tongues like you have never prayed before. And I want you to say, Holy Spirit, I want more of you. For those of you who have yet to speak in tongues, baptize in the Holy Ghost. Now is the time. And say, Holy Spirit, give me the gift of tongues. Ask somebody to lay hands on you and start speaking it out in Jesus' name by faith. By faith, begin to declare and speak forth the word, the word of heaven, heavenly language. Pray, say, Jesus, Holy Ghost, I want more. I want more of your power. I want more of your Holy Spirit. I want more of your anointing. I want more of you. We love you, Jesus. Jesus. We want more of you, Holy Spirit. In my life. In my spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Use me as you call I give my all for you alone Pour out your spirit Move in your power Hallelujah Jesus, you are all All my soul longs for of you want to say pastor i want to you know take this 10 days challenge and and it's between you and the lord you know i'm not gonna say you have to do it it's really between you and the lord but this week sorry a couple of weeks back i was very blessed because i have a member an adult who suddenly messaged me and said pastor can i meet you for coffee you and i know every time when a member asks me meet me for coffee i shudder <laughs> amen right Say, Lord, anoint me even more. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> it's either you go there and you hear all the problems and all the things that, that this person is suffering and going through and, and, and you feel so burdened after meeting up him and you say, God, please help him. <laughs> or either that, they are so blessed beyond measure. You know what? All this while when I meet members, it's either these two. Either they are so terrible or they are so very blessed. And when they're so blessed, you know what? They are so happy and they thank me. They thank God. You know what, Pastor? This year, I have another house. God blessed me with another five houses. God blessed me with two, three cars. You know what, Pastor? God just blessed me with one month bo uh, a one year bonus. And you know what? If I hear a member so suffering, I felt very bad and I felt very burdened. But if I go through and hear members so blessed, Hear them, I got one year bonus. I, I often left that place. Discouraged. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? <laughs> Lord, why him? How come not me? 
He got five houses. I still have to pay my house. Amen, right? But last week, two weeks ago, I was very blessed. This member, an adult, came to me and said, I want to meet you for coffee. Thank God he paid for the coffee. Hallelujah. Amen, right? I said, thank you very much. I said, oh, very nice. Amen, right? But you know what? He didn't rattle on his problems. He didn't tell me how blessed he was. You know what he shared with me throughout the entire one and a half hour coffee with me? He said, Pastor, I want to share with you that this year, it is the best spiritual life ever as a Christian. He shared with me his revelation, God's blessing, God's anointing. How God, he had an encounter with God. He kept on rattling his encounter with God. And he said, Pastor, I've been a Christian for the longest time. But this year, I can say, it is the most alive Christian life I've ever lived. <laughs> I was so blessed. I left that meeting so blessed. Can we in City Harvest Church have this new kind of testimony? Not the testimony, I'm so bad. <laughs> I almost died. Am I right? And not to the other extreme, always. God bless me. Five houses, ten houses. No. Can we have more testimony? Hearing you. You know what? I had an encounter with Jesus. I have a great revelation from God. I prayed for somebody and this person got healed. I prayed that this person over here got blessed. Because I went visitation, I lay hands on the sick. The sick get healed. Let's brag more about Jesus rather than the blessing. That's why we want to hear more of this testimony. I hear more of God. And when this person was relating to me his story, it was not super spooky, super spiritual. Woo, you know, no. Very natural. It is the best Christian life I've ever lived for the last 20 years as a Christian. I want to hear more testimonies like that among the adults here in City Harvest because we want more of the Holy Spirit. Amen? How many of you want to have more of Jesus in your life? Amen? I want you to lift up your hands. Say, Jesus, I want more of you. Holy Ghost, I want more of you. Hallelujah. We want to make this your prayer. We love you, God.
Father, I want to thank you for this morning. And Father, we pray that the Word of God will not just stay in our ears, but Lord, let it just sink deep inside our heart. Father, that we will seek after you. Pay a price for a consecrated life. Pay a price, Lord, to search you, to find you. And Father, we know, Lord, in the next 10 days, you're going to pour out your treasures, your anointing, your power and your presence so that everything that we do in our public life will leave a lasting imprint of the presence of God. Father, that's what we want to achieve and we want to, we want to experience. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon you here and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, let's give Jesus a big hand. Hallelujah. Amen.